Yo, yo, what's going on, you guys? You're Devon to Raw in Raw form, and welcome to another Help Me Devon Raw tutorial. And today, in this Help Me Devon Raw tutorial, I'll be showing you guys the tools that you need for mastering your own music. Now, before we go any further, I will tell you guys that please like and subscribe to keep this channel going and thriving right below. And also you can head over at any time to helpmedevon.info for presets, vocal chains, templates, and all kinds of goodies for your DAWs. Now, let's get right to it. Okay, so first and foremost, these are the things that you'll need for mastering. The very bare essentials in my mind to get a quality master sitting right at your house. First thing you're gonna need is an EQ. Next is gonna be a mid-side EQ, then analog saturation, then compression, then soft clipping, then limiting, and then metering. These are the tools that, honestly, in my opinion, when it comes to your home studio, you can get a quality master out of if you just have these things. Now, it might sound like a lot, but you actually have these things in a lot of your native, uh, to your DAW. So I'm gonna show you some right now. Let's get right to it. So. First and foremost, I'm going to start with an EQ. Now, EQ is very, very important when it comes to your masters, and that's because it's used to shape the tone, the balance, and all kinds of things like that in your mix. Now, you don't want to do so much when it comes to your mastering. I don't like to make big moves when it comes to my mastering or when it comes to mastering in general. So the reason why I like a lot of these mastering EQs, for instance, I'm using this T-Rax Master EQ, is because it allows me to boost and cut very small increments. I can literally boost something half a dB or cut something half a dB on this EQ. So let's EQ. Check this out. So you'll notice that I got a little bit more bump out of the bottom end, which was from that 42 hertz range. Then I wanted to boost a little bit of that presence in the mid range. I boosted at the 1200 hertz range, just a dB. And then I boosted at this very special range with a lot of mastering EQs have the ability to do at 23,000 hertz. Now, Grandy might be saying, why are you boosting at 23,000 hertz? Well, it gives me a special type of brightness to my vocal or air to my vocal that a typical EQ that you use you uh, use uh, doesn't have the ability to actually accomplish. Now, granted, we probably can't, most of us can't even hear above 17,000 uh, hertz, but there's certain upper harmonics at that top that does affect the overall sound that if you boost has an interesting sound and it's very pleasing to the air. So I like to have mastering EQs, a mastering EQ, invest in one. Okay, next thing I'm gonna move on over to is a mid-side EQ. Now. For those of you who don't know what a mid-side EQ is and why I think that it's very important, especially in mastering, is this. When it comes to a mid-side EQ, what it is is it allows you to affect the middle information separate from the side information. So what you're accustomed to is your usual stereo EQ where you affect the mix as a whole. But what the mid-side EQ allows you to do is it allows you to affect just the, the middle information as opposed to the side information or vice versa. So I can EQ the side information differently from how I EQ the middle information. So what I like to do when it comes to mid-side EQ is just two things, two very slight things. One is I like to roll off some of the low end on the side information. Now, why am I rolling off a little bit of the side information uh, as far as the low end is concerned? And that's because I don't want low end really on my sides. I rather leave that for the higher end stuff to give me a better perception of space, of of uh, of brightness, of, of clarity on my sides. And my middle is where those instruments as far as the kicks, the snares, and all that bottom end should be. So I try to take out some of that stuff on the sides as far as the low end is concerned, because to me, it's not necessary. One, two, it frees up headroom, which ultimately is gonna make your master louder. Okay, so check this out. I'm gonna take off the side information. As soon as I engage this, you'll see. So watch this. Oh, 
run up. It's my party, go turn up. Yeah. We still cool, like what up? Yeah. But I got a whole new swag. Yeah. And I'm in a brand new bag. Yeah. yeah. You see me now, oh yeah, I do this often. Taking trips lately. I'm so when I have it bypass, you'll feel like it's a little cloudy. It, it feels like something is kind of covering. And when I actually engage this, when I roll off that low end and boost some of the high end. You notice that the mix feels brighter. It feels more open. It has a little bit more clarity. Now, granted, like I always tell you guys, when it comes to mastering, I'm not making huge moves. I'm doing small incremental things that add up to a really big picture. So I'll exaggerate the boost on the side information at the high end just to give you a better idea. So check this out in the high end. So it's very slight. Even when you boost it a bunch, it's very, very slight because that is my side information. Now, think about it. You could say to yourself, well, I'm going to spread out the sides some more and then add some brightness to the sides. Now you're creating an entirely different type of mix. Whether you think it's right or wrong, it's something creatively that you can have to control and do better. So for me, I like to roll off a lot of that low end on the side information just so I can leave more room for that for that knock and that bottom in the middle information while cleaning up the entire mix. Mid side EQ for mastering, to me, a must. Okay. Next thing we're moving on over to is analog saturation. And if you watch this channel as frequent uh, uh, as I believe you do, uh, I love Fat Filter Saturn. I have yet to get the Fat Filter Saturn 2, I will, but I use this for analog saturation and I'm gonna show you exactly what it does. So check this out. So it feels a little bit more exciting, has a little bit more fun on it. And this is analog saturation emulation because it's a plugin. And what it's doing is it's adding extra harmonics to your music. And it's a very subtle, subtle thing, but it does so much at the same time. It makes the mix sound a little bit more exciting, a little bit more brighter, a little bit more open, and a little bit more fun. You can even do funky tricks like this in this particular analog saturated saturation plugin. Check this out. So you see, I boosted it about 2 dB just in that half side, as well as engaging some of the analog saturation, and it felt more exciting. And this is simple tricks that you could do just with using your analog saturator when it comes to your master. So highly recommend analog saturation to your masters. I, you need it. I think it's super needed. It helps a lot when it comes to just adding some upper harmonics or just harmonics in general across the entire mix. Okay, now let's move on over to some compression. And I'm gonna use a very popular compressor, especially bus compressor, uh, that I like to use from time to time. And this is the SSL Comp. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, let's completely put this back to a factory default, right? Let's put this back to just its bare bones. And let's find some, uh, do some compression. And long story short, what I'm trying to do with the compressor as far as what I'm trying to accomplish is, I'm trying to get a little bit of glue, right? I'm trying to make the mix feel a little bit more concise as far as what's poking out. Make it feel like it's it, it fits together in the mix. Control some of that vocal, control some of that kick, and bring them a little closer to the actual music and it feels nice like a glue. So that's what I'm trying to do. When it comes to my masters, I typically like to do uh, the most 2 dB of compression uh, when it comes to this stage. And this is why I think the compressor is very big when it comes to the mastering stage. It helps glue the mix together. Check this out. Let's master with the compressor. Blessings, shout out all my exes. I see now that I was headed in the wrong direction. I'm a come up, better take the stairs and you run up. It's my party, go turn up. Show me what I don't want, I need somebody, girl, real. 
Okay, now let's bypass it back and forth and take a listen to what it sounds like. Blessings, shout out all my exes. I see now that I was headed in the wrong direction. I'm a come up. Better take the stairs and you run up. It's my party, go turn up. Okay, so when you listen to that, you can tell that the vocals uh, and the music kind of sit a, a little bit better. It's this little bit of glue. It kind of helps everything kind of get a little bit more control over the entire mix. Now, for me, I always like to do attacks when it comes to my um, uh, uh, masters as far as compression is concerned. I don't want my transients to really get caught up in that. To be honest, I might even roll this attack back to 10 uh, just to make it a little bit slower. So I like to do slow attacks when it comes to my master compression. And the reason why I like to do the slow attack is because basically it helps you to avoid messing with those transients so much. Transients being kicks and snares. Allows for those things to still cut through your mix. Now, I like the auto function on the SSL compressor. It kind of has the, this intelligent way of just knowing when to release the compression. I really like it a lot. But like I said, I'm only doing a very slight, slight compressor when it comes to my mastering compressor. So that's why I think that the compressor, when it comes to mastering, is extremely important because it helps to add a special type of glue to the compressor. And you're just looking for a little bit, not much, just a slight little bit of compression. And you saw I boosted about 2 dB after I compressed. That's how much of a, a volume we had lost, but we got a nice more tighter mix and we boosted that. And now we have more volume as a whole. It's amazing to do it that way. Okay. Next thing we're gonna do is really the secret sauce. So I know that the common misconception, or I don't wanna say misconception, but the common train of thought is that most of the volume uh, that you get out of your track comes from the limiter. Well, for me personally, I don't like to get the volume out of my track from the lim limiter. I like to get it from one analog gear, or I like to get it from a soft clipper. Now, a soft clipper, Long story short, is a very special type of quote unquote, I would put it more in a limiter type of family. It has a very special way of how it cuts peaks. Now, what I say, what I mean when I say it cuts peaks is that, you know, basically when your kicks and snares, which are probably going to be one of the loudest, most transient things in your mix, come in, a soft clipper has a very special way of chopping those off to allow more volume in your mix. So basically, when it chops off the peaks, a limiter would chop off your peaks like this, hard, boom, not letting you through. But with a soft clipper, it clips it this way, kind of like a curve, a more smooth uh, uh, slope when it comes to this type of curve. Now, this is... Uh, uh, gives you ideas of analog gear. This is what makes analog gear so special because it has a very special way of how it chops peaks and how it takes distortion. So long story short, what the soft clipper allows you to do is get this type of characteristic while getting a lot of volume out of your track. I'll show you. All right, so check this out. So this is our soft clipper and check this out. Let's get our volume, watch your ears. Okay, so you see that I got a ton of volume from that and you're saying to yourself, well, how the heck did that work? Well, it works kind of like a limiter, but what I told you was it's cutting the peaks in a special way. It's not giving you a hard cut off when it comes to those peaks. As opposed to that, it's giving you this very soft curve, which allows those kicks and stuff like that to still shine, but it rounds those peaks off. So you're not limiting yet, but you're just getting more volume while it's cutting off the peaks in a smooth way, and it sounds more musical to my ears. This is the most powerful trick I can honestly say. Now granted, this can be too loud or uh, too low, but I'll show you how to check for those things when we go down the line. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the almighty limiter. And for me personally, guys, I like to get my limiter to about 3 dB of compression. Like I told you, I am not a big fan of using a limiter to really get volume, but I'm, I like to use the limiter more or less just to make sure those peaks are not cutting through uh, and just perhaps just to get a, a little bit more of that out. But I really am not a fan of limiters uh, because they really can damage your sound so much. So I like to use the soft clipper to really get the volume and use the limiter to really control those peaks. So check this out. Blessings, shout out all my exes. I see now that I was headed in the wrong direction. I'ma come up, better take the stairs and you 
run up. It's my party, go turn up. We still cool, like what up? Yeah, but I got a whole new swag. Yeah, and I'm in a brand new. Okay, and if you look at my limiter, what I'm really looking for that limiter to only kind of grab is the kick and the snare. I don't want to get the bass line into that limiter because then it'll feel like the, the limiter is working all the time. But really, I want that limiter just to work on that kick and that snare. And that's a good way to tell if you have too much limiting going on. When that kick and snare, uh, as far as the, the gain reduction is on, and if you see other things getting caught in that limiter, there's a chance that you might have too much limiting. And then this ultimately just damages your mix. So for me, I've learned or like to just basically let the limiter catch only the the kick and the snare uh, to basically control those peaks and just to give me a little bit more volume and that's it. So for me, I like to usually go with a pretty fast release and a medium to slow attack when it comes to uh, uh, my attack and release settings for my limiter. And this is why the limiter is super important because it allows you to control your transients and your peaks and to get that mix level with the volume and things of that nature. Okay. Next thing I move on to is, I lied about the last part, this is the most important thing, metering. And this is the thing that gets overlooked, the thing that people don't look for, check, or use at all. Now, when it comes to metering, the new standard that is used for streaming platforms, because I'm gonna assume that's what you're gearing towards as far as your music is concerned, is LUFS. Now, I'm not gonna get too deep into what LUFS are, but just know this is the new standard for measuring volume when it comes to streaming, okay? So basically, you are trying to target a certain amount of LUFS, kind of how we say DB. Well, we're trying to catch or measure a certain amount of LUFS in our song, okay? So how do we measure LUFS? So there's two plugins that I will recommend to you guys. One is the WLM Plus meter from Waves, okay? And another is Insight from Isotope. Now, the Insight from Isotope, Insight 2 actually from Isotope, it is a, if you're more of a beginner, it's a lot more simple in its GUI. As far as the interface is concerned, seeing it, you can tell like, okay, this seems a little bit more uh, self-explanatory as far as what you see, as opposed to the WLM Plus. Now the WLM Plus is extremely powerful in the sense of that um, you can basically, uh, uh, chop peaks and there's kind of like limiters and all kinds of a true peak limiter actually built in. You don't have to use that stuff. But if you're just trying to meter, these are the two meters that I typically go with to check. Now, my main thing is I'm shooting for about negative 10 LUFs um, when it comes to this. Uh, and the long, the really the best way I can explain this to you is when you're trying to measure LUFs, you need to play the entire song. You need to play the song in its entirety for the meter to tell you exactly how many LUFs your song is because it measures an average. So there's a short-term LUFs and there's a long-term LUFs. What the streaming services are looking at is the long-term LUFs, AKA the overall average sound as far as your audio is concerned. So what I'll do is I can play this from the very top Look at the short term, look at the long term, and then I'll explain to you what's actually happening. So, check this out. Now I know we've been hurt, taken for granted, beat and battered beyond the breath of our lives. Mm -hmm. Can I get a witness? But we are better now. Understand, that woman can't hurt you, and that man don't know what he lost. Mm -hmm. Now I got a young brother here that's finally seen the light. Brother Devon, can you come up here and share? Blessings, shout out all my exes. I see now that I was headed in the wrong direction. I'ma come up, better take the stairs and you run up. It's my party, go turn up. We still cool like what up, yeah. Now, I want you to take my word for it when I tell you that I got this song to about negative 10 lusts. When it finished plays playing, when it's finished playing the entire song, you'll see that the average is about negative 10. Now you'll notice at the very beginning of the song that you saw that negative 15 and negative 17, really low when it came to lust. But you'll notice these really loud moments in the short term where it was like negative, negative nine, negative eight. Well, that's what the lust meter is doing on the long term. It's measuring all of those moments and averaging it, it out basically. So this is why you have to play the entire song to figure out where your actual master is sitting when it comes to the Luff meters. So always check for that. The very last thing I wanna show you guys is basically in a little bonus. 
Uh, I've shown this in past tutorials, but this is something that is just a little bonus for you guys to just analyze and see for yourself. This is called the Loudness Penalty Analyzer by a company called Meter Plugs. And I've been using this for a little while. What it does is it emulates the characteristics of streaming services. So it takes your song, puts it in the plugin, and says, this is how it'll sound on Spotify, iTunes, Deezer, YouTube, all of these different streaming platforms that you're most likely going to be putting your music on. So check this out. What you'll notice is it's going to tell you how much these streaming platforms are going to turn down your song. Now, granted, you're saying, why are they turning down my song? Well, it's okay. A lot of these songs are all turned down. For instance, at this moment of this recording, Spotify's uh, Luff's uh, uh, target is negative 14 uh uh, luffs, and then you have Apple, which has negative 16 luffs. So Apple will turn your song down more than uh, Spotify typically would, and that's just how their algorithms work, and that's how they do this. So it's going to let you hear how much they're going to turn this down. Now, granted, I told you I like to target around negative 10 to each his own when it comes to that. What you don't want is you don't want them to try to turn your song up because that would probably introduce some type of limiting and some type of other funky things. I'd rather them turn it down than up. And a lot of other people actually go with this too. So check this out. I'm gonna play it from one of the louder parts. Blessings, shout out all my exes. I see now that I was headed in the wrong direction. I'ma come up, better take the stairs when you run up. This is my party, go turn up. Okay, so let's look at this right quick. Um, now, granted, I always say I do recommend to play this in its entirety just like that because in my head, it feels like it's like a, some type of luff meter. It, it has to be where it's reading this and deciding, oh, this needs to come down a certain amount of dB. So you see iTunes, for instance, like I told you guys before, negative six, and you see Spotify, it's turning it down only negative five. And this is basically what I was telling you guys before. Uh, Spotify has a negative 14 luffs uh, when it comes to its, um, when it comes to its algorithm and it's turning me down negative five, which tells me that I am at negative nine. I'm actually loud when it comes to it. But remember, it needs to measure it overall. So this is why I say you need to play it the whole way through. Uh, YouTube does it at negative 5.3 at this moment. Amazon has their thing. You can see that each platform has a different way to treat your audio. And you can basically see right here how much they're gonna turn it down. And you can press preview if you wanted to as well to hear how it sounds when it's lowered. So check this out. Blessings, shout out all my exes. I see now that I was headed in the wrong direction. I'ma come up, better take the stairs and you run up. It's my party, go turn up. We still cool like what up, yeah. So when I click it, press preview, it lets me know what it's going to sound like basically on those streaming platforms. Extremely powerful. And I hope this helps you so much. Once again, make sure you guys comment, like, subscribe. That was my tutorial on the tools that I believe you'll need when it comes to mastering. Please let me know how you like the video. Comment, like, subscribe uh, down below. Remember, you can also visit helpmedevon.info for presets, uh, our vocal chains, and a bunch of other goodies for your DAWs. Make sure you follow us at Help me Devon on the Instagram and until next time you guys.